So we get a a new book that we're starting today, the book of Shemais, Exodus. It starts on what seems like quite a negative note. Yosef passes away, the whole generation of uh, brothers of that era are all gone, and not a moment passes, and already King Paro is tricking the Jewish people into slavery, and it turns into oppression, and things start going real downhill for uh, the Jewish people. And Moshe is born during a time when there is a decree to throw every new baby boy into the Nile River. And somehow, miraculously, uh, survives and is being raised as a prince in the, um, in the Egyptian palace. And here is where our narrative picks up. I'm going to share the psukim inside. Bayihi, bayamim hahem, and it was during that time. Vayigdal Moshe, Moshe grew up. Vayetze yalachi, vayarbisli v'loisam, and he goes out to see his brothers, and he sees all of their pain and hardship. Vayar ish mitzri makes ivri meyachav, and he sees one Egyptian taskmaster just beating the heck out of a Jewish slave, really abusing him. Vayifen koi vakoi, Moshe is just overwhelmed to see such abuse and such trauma that uh, that his brothers are are facing, and he looks this way and that way. Vayar ki ein ish, and he sees there's no person watching. And he hits that Egyptian and hides him in the sand, buries him. And he goes out the next day and he sees two Jewish guys quarreling with each other. And he says, come on, guys, it's enough that we're facing all of this abuse and oppression from the Egyptians. And we can't, uh, can't afford to be wicked to each other. Well, why can't, how could you hate your brother? And they said, who appointed you to be the leader over us? <laughs> Are you going to kill us? Like you killed the Egyptian? Yira Moshe, Moshe got scared, afraid. Hayoimer Achan Neida Hadavar said, "Uh oh, my secret may have gotten out." And he doesn't run away right away. He kind of hangs out over there. But uh, the next verse says, "Vayishma Parai." Parai eventually finds out. And he calls for his guards to catch Moshe, and they bring him into the palace, and they're ready to execute him. But in the last minute on the execution block, Moshe manages to escape, and he runs away from Paroi. Vayeshev at its Midian, Vayeshev ala Be'er, and he runs out of Egypt to Midian, and there he's uh, sitting on the well, beside the well. Rashi has two interpretations for Vayira Moshe. Moshe got afraid. What do you think he was afraid of? Paro's going to kill him. Rashi just says, Kipshutai, obviously. He was afraid for his life. But then he adds another interpretation, Umidrashai. The Midrashic explanation is, He was afraid for the sake of the Jewish people. He said, Oh no. There are informants amongst us. There are wicked people here. Maybe God is not going to find them befitting for um, for the redemption. He knew eventually Hashem is going to take us out. This is the promise. But he says this, this might be a long road 
because it doesn't look like they're really ready for it if uh, this is the type of behavior that they have with uh, one another and uh, they're ready to um, to do all these wicked things. So we have, whenever Rashi brings two explanations for something, it's because the first one is not entirely sufficient. So what could possibly be wrong with just explaining it simply? That what was he afraid of? That the word got out. The thing is, if Moshe really felt that his life was on the line, it should have, he should have right away ran away. But we don't find that that's what he did. And because it's like it was only after the story progresses, and then Paro finds out. First, Moshe's afraid. And then Paro finds out and uh, captures him and brings him in. Then he runs away. That's why Rashi is sort of um, forced to give an alternative explanation as well, this Midrashic explanation that he wasn't afraid at first for his life. He was afraid for the stature of the people at that time. And he was afraid for, for the collective, for the, uh, for the state of humanity at that point and uh, worried, how is the redemption going to come about? But even, even so, whenever there is a verse that, fir that first has it explained simply, even the Midrashic or alternative explanations never detract from the original Shute um, Shal Mikra, the straightforward, simple meaning of the verses. And so in our case, we have... Moshe being afraid. Now, what? You know, fear is a, a natural uh, emotion we have. We have uh, our, our natural uh, sense of uh, self-preservation. And when we feel like our life is in danger, then um, we are afraid. But it still begs the question, what was Moshe really afraid of? Shouldn't he have just had full trust in Hashem, and then uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't need that attribute of fear? So we find in the Medrash, Beis Rabba, two great individuals who had fear, and we're going to explain the reason for their fear. Yaakov was very afraid and um, and distressed. Rabbi Pinchas says in the name of Reuben, There were two people that God gave a clear, explicit promise, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to save you, and yet they were afraid. The choicest of the forefathers, Yitzchak, I mean uh, Yaakov, and and the best of the prophets, a.k.a. Moshe. Hashem promises Yaakov before he goes down to Lavan's house, I am going to be with you. And yet, we find at the end, Yaakov was afraid. And Yaakov was afraid. And so we have the best of the best, the uh, the choicest of our forefathers, Yaakov, and the choicest of the prophets, Moshe, who both had an explicit divine promise, I'm going to be with you. And nevertheless, they were afraid. What did Yaakov say? I feel small because of all of the kindness and all of the truth that you've done for me. He felt like his merits were depleted because of the... He felt unworthy for any more favors because of all of the kindness and great, uh, wonderful things that Hashem did for him. And similarly, Moshe, he became afraid and distressed, was also 
Moshe was afraid of Og, the king of Bashan, because he said, you know, of, of his own humility. It wasn't because of uh, a lack of faith, but he felt that um, perhaps I had done something wrong. Perhaps that I had, I'm not really up to scratch. And therefore, you know, that's why uh, I, it's it's not, um, he's not really afraid for his life. He's afraid that Hashem's not going to save him because he doesn't really deserve it. So having uh, complete faith in Hashem, yet having small confidence in themselves, like Ketanti, can seem like a very lofty quality. It's like, who do you think you are? You know, the, even the greatest of our forefathers and even the greatest of the prophets, they said, Ketanti, I'm small. I'm unworthy of your, of your salvation. And so this attitude, on the one hand, is understandable as, um, in a way, a very lofty uh, divine service that you never stand so tall and proud and sure of yourself, like you're imp impervious to any uh, any sort of um, harm because you're, uh, you're, you're God's gift to mankind. It's a certain sense of, of humility that can promote teshuva, transforming yourself. But on the other hand... It's not exactly what it means to have trust in Hashem. We have a mitzvah to put our trust in, in Hashem. And one of the foremost scholars who wrote a book on having trust in Hashem is Rabbeinu Bechayo. He wrote his book, Toivis Halavavis, The Duties of the Heart. And I want to, um, to read the first chapter after a lengthy introduction where he talks about the uh, the benefits and uh, is trying to inspire us to do the work to uh, to have betachin and the effects that it can have on us. The very first chapter he defines what betachin is, which is seemingly at odds with Moshe's fear and uh, and Yaakov's fear, which uh, we'll need to take a uh, another look at. So here's Chayvus Alavavis, the duties of our heart. Rabbeinu Bachaya says, Ach mohus abetochen hii, menuchas nachshoi abeteyach, shiyo liboi somoch hamish v'teyach olav, shiyasa atoiv, v'anochoi me'inyin asher yiftiach olav, kefi yecholos v'daytoi, v'ma shemapik tuvasoi. Trusting in Hashem means that you have complete peace of mind. The person who has trust has no fear, no worries. They, they're fully in Hashem's hands. They put their full heart and trust in Hashem. No worries. This is the mitzvah of betachin. Yisroel betach pa Hashem, like we say in Tehillim. Ezra mumiginam bohu Yisroel. Trust in Hashem. He is our help and our shield. Hashem is always watching over Israel. Hashem is always watching over us. And there's no reason to be afraid. Betachin means that we have um, a complete trust in Hashem. He says, If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I uh, overcome them? Don't be afraid of them, comes the verse in Devarim and says, don't be afraid. If somebody feels like there's armies or uh, nations that are greater than them with larger numbers, don't be afraid. Remember, uh, the that, that, remember to bring the divine salvation into your heart. And put your trust in him. Like it says in Tehillim, and second. So this verse of trusting in Hashem is 
is quoted in this uh, verse in Deuteronomy that says, when you go out to war and you see the horses and chariots, forces larger than yours, don't be afraid. God tells you. And the, and the, and the Torah says, don't be afraid. We're warned that if a person sees trouble nearby, the salvation of Hashem should be in their heart. And you should trust Hashem. Like it says in Tehillim, his salvation is, to, is near to those who fear him. And likewise, it's written in Isaiah, what ails that you fear man whose end is to die? Why are you fearing a mortal? I have trust in Hashem. And the Rambam brings down this very verse, that the soldiers going out to war should not be afraid. Is not just a command to the IDF soldiers going out into the dangerous uh, uh, fields of, uh, of war, but rather it's a general precept that the Rambam brings down in mitzvah number 58 as a, as a precept for each and every one of us to not be afraid is the mitzvah that we have to constantly put our trust in Hashem. And so this is not just a particular mitzvah according to the way that Maimonides codifies the Jewish law. It's not just a um, it's not just a particular circumstance that you know when you have soldiers going out to war, they're forbidden to be afraid. And according according to uh, the uh, the stories in in Tanakh, if there were soldiers in King David's army that were afraid, they were not allowed to join the battalion. Uh, it was uh, it was illegal. Yeah, one of the prerequisites to being a soldier in King David's army was that you're not afraid. And uh, I heard in this um, in this war in Gaza, they're not uh, doing mandatory, um, um, you know, um, mandatory recruitments to go into Gaza. Only the soldiers that want to go that are not afraid, those are the ones that are allowed to go. And this goes in line with the general mitzvah of having betachin, which is applicable not just to soldiers going out to war, but to each and every one of us at all times and in all places to put our full and complete trust only and completely in God alone. So like it's the it's the literal, but but like really also very much like the metaphorical concept of like battle or war like not everything is like an actual physical battle some things are like internal battles or like social like situations that it all like feels like it's like a like small battles in your life right and we have like countless verses throughout our prophets and many times throughout Tehillim that talk about having trust in Hashem but um the 613 mitzvot are all from verses in the five books of Moses, and particularly the verses that are post the giving of the Torah. That's where the 613 comes from, between the giving of the Torah and um, and the end of Deuteronomy. And so Maimonides, who uh, meticulously goes through and counts each one of the 613 for negative mitzvah number 58, he says, this is the mitzvah to have trust in Hashem. That, this whole, you know, book of Chavis al how do you do that? Well, Rabbeinu Bachaya wrote a book on it, right? <laughs> but, but the mitzvah comes from the title that says, do not be afraid, which begs the question, here, Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid. At first, we, we tried to explain it as, this is, he was afraid because he felt, he felt himself unworthy, I'm small, I don't really deserve it. But on the other hand, we have this mitzvah of don't be afraid. And that the very nature of having the tochim is that you are in a state of complete tranquility and no fear. So, so here... Like... Oh, sorry. No, you can, yeah, you can say it. Yeah, yeah, it's like this uh, song in Hebrew. Kol olam kolom gesher tsar meod. The main thing is don't be afraid at all. But how can you not be afraid if it's a narrow bridge and one little slip you're going to fall off to the right and one little yeah. slip you fall off to the left? How could you not be afraid? Yeah. 
Yeah, like I acrobat, the only the way to cross the song is that that it is a scary world out there. Yeah. And not everybody is so scrupulous in their action. It says, that there's nobody so heavenly and so righteous that they live here in this world and they don't end up sinning. They don't end up doing something wrong. So there is always the possibility that maybe I don't deserve the divine salvation in this moment. Maybe um, I already got the reward or the credit for all of my good deeds that I've done. So how could you have tranquility? So maybe here's a suggestion. If you are entirely righteous and you have no evil that's coming to you, you don't deserve any evil, then for sure you don't have anything to worry about and you can put your trust in Hashem. But if not, then we understand because of our faith in God, that everything that happens is ultimately orchestrated by the creator, by the master of the entire world, and nothing, and nobody has any power or jurisdiction to harm you or hurt you in any way that is not uh, divinely ordained. How we can reconcile some of the most horrific things that happened is, uh, is beyond us, yet we re retain the certain, um, this, this faith, that everything is coming from Hashem. You don't attribute God-like powers or any sort of dominion or jurisdiction over yourself or Am Yisrael outside of Hashem. They're not left to their own devices. God is in control. And we have a concept that even the corrective measures that Hashem issues are for our own good. And so the person can have full betachin, thinking either I don't deserve any evil and therefore have nothing to worry about. Or if I am supposed to, then Hashem knows what's best for me. Like the, the Alter Rebbe explains that there's things that are so good that it's so lofty that it's kind of earth shattering when it, when it's, uh, when it trickles down into this world that it is experienced as something that doesn't feel good. Yet we have faith that Hashem is in control and um, and really, ultimately, it's for the best. However, this attitude alone contradicts and runs contrary to the very approach of betachin as described by our dear friend, Rebbeinu Bechaya and Shana Betachin. Let's uh, fast forward to Chapter 2 of Shara Betalchin. is Chapter 2. The one who, uh, the one in who he trusts is absolutely generous and kind to the deserving and to the undeserving. This is a key fundamental principle where he's explaining how can we have trust in Hashem? He's saying, well, one of the keys to being able to have trust is to know that Hashem is going to do generous and kind things, whether or not we deserve it. And he, he explains in Kada Kemach, one who trusts in Hashem will be saved from, dis from distress in reward for the trust, even though he might have deserved the opposite to come to him. So trust it's not just faith. There's a difference between faith and trust. Trust is knowing that everything will work out for the best in an open and revealed manner. And that's how you could be so tranquil and completely at ease. So somebody who has faith, they believe in Hashem, and they know that everything that Hashem does is for the best. That's sort of the way that we can also contextualize things that happened in the past. But there is a separate mitzvah to believe in Hashem and to trust in Hashem. And so having the general attitude of God knows what's best for me and it's all going to be for the best only qualifies you as a ma'amin, somebody who believes that Hashem is in charge. But you haven't yet 
taken upon yourself the mitzvah of betachin. Because when you take upon yourself the mitzvah of betachin, you're completely tranquil knowing that Hashem's salvation is nearby, that no matter what the circumstances are, even if they're impossible circumstances, well, God is beyond all of the possibilities and created nature itself and is not limited by the jurisdictions of what, uh, what is possible. God can do the impossible and can save you no matter what the circumstances are. And having that type of trust, regardless of the circumstances and regardless of your own moral standing, what you've done up until now is the very definition of having trust in Hashem. Now, this doesn't mean that it's a, a free-for-all, right? Because uh, oh, you can have trust in Hashem, that Hashem will save you and, and will take care of you. So who cares what I do? I could just uh, act however I want and, uh, and Hashem saves those who are worthy and those who are not worthy. Well, this avayda, this, this effort and energy that we put into putting our trust in Hashem does not exclude our actions. It's not like, well, when it comes to, I don't know, Hashem saving me from my foxhole, I know Hashem could do anything and Hashem wants what's best for me and, and can, uh, can take me out of this uh, dire circumstance. But when it comes to earning a livelihood, well, over there, without lying and cheating, how am I gonna be able to put food on my table? Putting your full trust in Hashem means that of course Hashem knows what actions are best for you. That's why he told you to do them. Not because he wants, you know, some sort of uh, puppet or slave. Because he's giving you the ways to, uh, to be like Hashem, the, the most advantageous and blessings and, and goodness. And so part of having betachin is also doing teshuva. Putting yourself in Hashem's hands and saying, I'm all yours, is also saying, I don't need to find extracurricular, meaning extra Torah, outside of the Torah uh, paradigm, ways of finding uh, advantageous uh, avenues for my own well-being, tranquility, or uh, parnasa, uh, financial security. You can do that all within the confines of Torah observance when a person puts their self in, in, in Hashem's hands, so then by, you know, automatically, you know, they're going to, uh, you know, it would be, it'd be self-contradictory to say, you know, I have full trust, yet I'm going to do my own thing. But nevertheless, it doesn't negate in any moment, it doesn't negate the divine salvation just because of what you did yesterday. That's what the, the Rebbein B'chai is, is coming to say, is that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, you can always put your full hope and trust in Hashem that it will actually be good. It was actually, it was interesting. I was watching, um, there was something like a story to inspire. There was a woman, she looked like she was about in her 50s, and she said on October 7th, she heard what was like the chaos that was going on. And in her, she was in the kibbutz um, bear Aza, and she she went into the closet, like she had this big closet in her room, and she literally just jumped inside. She said with her little phone for light, and um, she said she had a book of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and she said she went in with that, and she was literally like reading it, like as... She said she heard her door being blasted off. She said the terrorists were like in her house, like in that room that she was like in the closet. And she said she wasn't afraid. And I'm like, like, I'm like, I guess this is the level of Bitaka that it's, I didn't know it was actually possible, but I've, I've heard a live person <laughs> say that she, she, she actually, she said, she, she said what she said to Hashem. She said, God, if it's my time, it's my time. But if it's not my time yet, then I want to get closer to you. And um, just like from the way she was dressed, I saw like she didn't have a religious upbringing. Like this is just, just from like the depth of her soul, like her, like that just came out in the moment of like when she felt like it was, you know, a life or death moment. And she said like, it, it was only like, all he had to do was open the closet. Like it doesn't even make sense that like the terrorists were in that room, like in her house, she said her door was blasted off and like, she said like when she, she said she was in that closet for 12 hours, 
um, before she got out. And she said when she got out, she saw like all the destruction around her. And like, like, I don't know. I was like, I guess it was, she had such a trust in God that like, I guess it, it's the only thing that makes sense that actually like made the terrorists not open up that closet. Like it was like as big as the closets behind us. It was like big. It wasn't like a little mini, like tiny little closet that she hid inside that like he wouldn't notice. It was like the whole room. Like you walk into the room, you see the closet. <laughs> I just thought it was really, um, obviously things in our lives aren't that traumatic, but, but like our little anxiety inducing things that happen or when we go on the news or when we see certain anti-Semitic stuff going on, I was like to have even, even an iota of her like faith and trust in Hashem, I was like, would, um, <laughs> that's quite a story. That's what? quite a story. Yeah, I mean, she she recounts what happened to her. And then I was trying to look for it on YouTube to try to get it again, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> it just, like, popped up. You know, like, you, like, go to something, and when things that you generally sometimes search, it'll just pop up on your YouTube. So I tried finding it. I couldn't. But um, but she, like, showed how literally, like, the destruction around her. She said, that was my neighbor's house. It, like, it was burned to the ground, and that was... and she just describes how it doesn't even make sense that like he didn't open up the closet. So well, I guess it's because she had that trust in Hashem. He didn't open up the closet because now that we're learning this, that, um, so there's a certain key that, uh, that we can get a hold of uh, an expression from the Tzamach Sadik that the Rebbe would often quote. There was a man uh, Michal Berliner, who came to the Rebbe crying, davening to, to, um, to Hashem, and he, he asked this Sadik, the Sadak Sadik, to pray for him and intercede in heaven on his behalf for the sake of his son, who was in a dire uh, circumstance medically, he was, uh, he was dangerously ill. And he asked him to uh, to intercede and arouse the heavenly mercies. The Samach Sadek answered, Trachkot vetzainkot. Think good, and it will be good. Which implies that the very thinking good, the thinking positive, is what will bring about the positive results. Now we have an a similar yet very different American or English expression of positive thinking leads to positive results. And that itself has its own sort of virtue, but I want to delve a little bit deeper into the mystical workings of our reality. It says in Tehillim, Hashlech al Hashem Yehovecha, Cast your worries upon Hashem. Hashem. Cast your burden on Hashem. Hashem will take care of you and he will never let you falter. The Kabbalah, Sefer Azayar says, Take come and see. Alma This world is positioned to always receive from on high. It's called a good stone. And the heavenly worlds are always positioned in a way where they're ready to give as long as if a person shows a shining face from below, then that shining face is shine down from heaven. But if a person stands in a way of depression and sadness, so it kind of blocks off the chain or the channel of uh, that salvation uh, stemming and, and coming down. And so having bitachin, the dynamics in, in the way that it works, like the 
spiritual scientific method for how this lines up is that through betachin, it elicits, having that betachin elicits the divine blessings of salvation to be manifest in this world. It's not just that a person has faith. I believe that Hashem can save me. And Hashem is all powerful. And Hashem can even save somebody whether or not they're righteous or deserving. Betochein is a avoidas hanefesh. It takes avoida and yagia, hard work and effort to cast off, like we said, hashlech al Hashem Yehovah, to really cast off all other hopes and all other mediums of salvation that you're putting your full and complete hope in Hashem alone. That, that Avaida, that soul um, exertion that we, we do, this labor to cast off any sort of machination of, of how we're going to uh, bring about a good circumstance through this way or through that way, and really see yourself as fully in Hashem's hands so there's no one else that has any say or any power or any sort of uh, influence. It's God alone that's the only source of influence. So this is not an easy thing to do, right? Because we live in a world where all we see in front of us is, uh, is my boss is telling me this and my coworker is telling me that and the nation is saying this and then, then the UN is saying that and we feel like, oh my God, everybody's got a big say and everybody's got a big, and we got to debunk this and we got to debunk that because uh, this is, you know, these are the, the, the big powers in the world that can really uh, uh, either, uh, you know, bring about a lot of uh, screw up in our lives. It takes a lot of energy and effort to really put our full hope and trust in Hashem alone. And in the merit of that effort and that avoid that energy, that, um, that divine service, Hashem rewards us in kind by bringing a divine salvation in a way that's um, above and beyond what it is that you deserve, what it is that the, the world can naturally handle. And so betochein is this super powerful tool. The Baal Shem Tov's thought that, that if Hashem needs to punish somebody because it just it, there's certain things that they need, his hands are tied when the person has betochein, and he can't do it. He has to sort of try to take away their betochein first and, and then you know give that corrective measure because with betochein, it's so powerful that Hashem always responds in a kind and uh, and a good revealed way. But it's not easy. But that's that's the mitzvah of betachin. It's not meant to be necessarily an easy way out, but it's this full devotion that we have to Hashem. Our our hope is only in Hashem. I mean that that kind of goes back to like even like Yo Yosef like how his brothers may have like sent him to be a slave but like you know at, like it was never like a moment of despair for him because he just you know th maybe they executed the action but like the whole it was already like the whole the whole path was like up to Hashem right and so therefore he didn't become distressed over it and then, and it's also like you don't lose a day a moment of your life when you have trust in hashem even if at that moment you feel like you know in retrospect i had full trust and i didn't see the fruition of the plan so how could that be or what's going on right <laughs> well Every moment that you do live with this type of spirit, this type of energy of like full devotion and full trust in Hashem is a moment worth living. Right, because there's the pain and there's the suffering. So if a person's going through pain and pain, you can't take away. But the suffering is like that's in the mind, like thinking negatively, like I'm not going to get better or this is going to be horrible or like that's that's like thinking about negatively about the future. So that we could avoid with betachin. 
And then God willing also make it that there shouldn't be pain in the future, that the pain should go away. So when a person truly trusts Hashem alone from the depths of his soul to the point where there's no more worries, then that itself evokes a reciprocal response from above, granting kindness uh, in an open and a revealed way. It's very easy to sell someone on or to live a life of fear and anxiety. It's really not hard to sell anxiety. There are religions that are based off of showing how unworthy you are and how um, you know you should be so anxious of uh, of sinning and you should be so scared of anything because you're going to burn in hell or you're going to get. It's not hard to uh, to get somebody to to fall into those types of traps. You know what is marvelous. You know what is a spiritual life worth living? It's the tools that the Torah gives us to live with betachin. This is a type of life. You look at somebody who walks around this world with betachin. It's like, oh, that's an oivad alikim. That's somebody who's really working on themselves to serve Hashem. Not just buying into the fear mongering that the news so easily gets people caught up in. That's easy. That's easy business. What's hard, but in a way, so much more worth it, is the type of avayda, the type of uh, divine service that we're talking about here. Which is, cast your burden on Hashem. Don't put your hope and trust in anyone or anything else. Live fearlessly. You but know. I was thinking, like, when I was learning this with my husband, um, I was thinking, like, you know, there is it really possible, let's say, the situation in Israel, like, we all want to do something to help out. So, yes, we could help out a little financially. We could help out, like, you know, get everyone together and, like, see what we could do, you know, for the Jewish people or for each other and to be a support group. But, like, can we actually... Like, it seems like, you know, almost 200 soldiers, I think, I don't remember what the exact death toll is, 173. I hope it didn't rise since then, since I checked. But like, and then I heard that Netanyahu said it's going to go for a few more months. I'm like, does that mean that it's going to be close to, let's say, 400 at the end of the next few months? Like, just like, do the math. You know what I mean? This is with all the miracles. I'm like, is it possible that, like, like, is it my bitachin? could only affect my personal life or is it possible if my trust in Hashem, if I really work on myself to do this can also affect like a global situation. So I was funny that when he was preparing for the class, I was like, I, I turned to my husband, I'm like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, if we really <laughs> work ourselves to on our own, be tough on Hashem, really trusting in Hashem, meaning that, we realize that Hamas is not the one in control. Hashem is the one in control. So literally our hands, the the, soul, the the lives of the soldiers are not in Hamas's hands. It's not like they're going into Gaza, so they're going into the bear's mouth, so to speak. So, um, so Hamas could have a hold on them or like Hashem is totally in control. So it's like if we really ourselves live with this message, and then obviously try to see in my own personal life, what can I do to increase my relationship with Hashem? And then let's say, then we're, um, you know, having a class on it to spread it, to spread the sureness and this total faith that we realize Hashem is in control and um, to not be worried and not be afraid because it's going to be good. And um, the soldiers are going to come home safely to their wives and to their kids or to their parents and their families, if they're not yet married, a lot of them are like literally like kids, like 19, 20, 21, like literally they haven't even lived the life yet. Um, so he's like, you know what? It says that, and then my husband said that if you, if when people in, because of trust in Hashem, it could also bring about the coming of Mashiach, so it, regardless of whether where each person is standing, because it's like, you can't control where someone else is standing. You can only control your own relationship with Hashem, but it could even bring about the redemption from exile completely. 
So then, and there are sources for that that we're probably going to get to later, but that for sure, it can help, literally help um, with the protection and safety and security of the soldiers in Israel uh, and all the Jewish people living in Israel. Yeah, this is so true. Like I just uh, recently started a book about uh, psychosomatics, so how emotions affect the our health. And also it's very interesting that our body, we have like a, so the whole world is a vibration and fear is a very strong emotion, even, you know, like anger. So, and we change the vibration of our body, like when we experience fear and it affects the vibration of the people next to us because we are all connected. So it's not only destructive, but it's also selfish to the environment. Because when we allow these emotions to like, we don't control it. So actually, like, yeah, we like we poison the environment. So it's very, so, so, this is so true. Like even yeah. on a, not just a spiritual, in, on, even though on a physical level, right, just an emotional level, right. And it's yes. and it's worthy to note that this sicha, this discourse that we're we're learning from the Lubavitcher Rebbe was first published just before the outbreak of the first Gulf War, when the whole world was trembling in fear because they thought Saddam Hussein had an arsenal of weapons of mass construct uh, of mass destruction and and uh, he was going to use them and everybody was freaking out and and those were like hard um those were uh, highly charged and very tense moments as um and everybody was was uh, really unsettled and here the Rebbe spoke calmly and in a steady voice, reassuring both the Jews and the non-Jews that Eretz Yisrael is the safest place in the world. Hashem's eyes are upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And in general, the whole world is under the auspices of Hashem's uh, protection and divine watch. And we don't need to get all fearful and worked up. We can live with this betaching this full and complete trust in Hashem. And that is really revolutionary, very transformative. It's, yeah, I'm, it, I'm actually like, sorry, really, sorry, just really quick, just really um, mm -hmm. surprised at how many of the fallen soldiers' families are like not angry or upset as much. I mean, I'm sure they're like very sad, but they all are like, well, you know, you did you you did the best you could and like I'm not mad at you and I think that that also is kind of like an expression of that bitachon. Yep, yep. It's a it's also bitachon goes hand in hand with emuna, and emuna our uh, our faith in Hashem helps us with acceptance because everything that happens as inconceivable and um, and unexplainable as it is is um, there's a certain hopelessness and helplessness that one feels when the world is left to its own devices. With that type of mentality, there is a real freak out and a real like just inconsolable, inconsolable um, upsetness over the atrocities that took place. But Imuna alone is just the acceptance of what happened. What's our attitude for the future? That we should also in the future have acceptance for whatever tragedies are gonna happen in the future? No, we have betochen that there's not gonna be tragedies in the future. That it's gonna be good, that God's gonna bless us. That's the way we live our lives. Not with, well, we had faith in the past and that helped us get through these troubling times. Our faith in the future will help us through the troubling times that are yet to come. No, then you're lacking the whole mitzvah of al tisyon. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid. <laughs> the Torah commands us, have betachim, have trust. How can I have trust? What if I don't deserve it? The trust is not dependent on whether or not you deserve it. It's l'rayim <laughs> ulatoivim, Hashem. It can, Hashem can and does bestow kindness and mercies to those that deserve it and, and to those who don't deserve it. 
So it's not dependent on whether or not, uh, like uh, we said about Yaakov and Moshe, they were afraid. Oh no, maybe um, you know uh, my merits are have been used up. It's nothing to do with merits. I heard there was a good. Hashem, Hashem is our loving Father. He's going to take care of us, no matter what, whether or not we deserve it. I heard a good analogy for that because, like, sometimes it could feel like, oh, am I deserving or am I not deserving? Um, there was an analogy of if you have a kid, and let's say you have a two-year-old kid, and um, he's walking with his father and holding his father's hand, and all of a sudden it starts to be like today's weather, like windy and stormy and rainy. And this little kid is holding, his two-year-old kid is holding his father's hand so tight because he doesn't want to be blown away. He's like, and he's clutching his father's hand so tight. Do you think the father's just going to let go and say, you know, remember when you misbehaved yesterday? <laughs> of course not. The father's going to feel his son clutching him so tight. And he's like, he's going to tell him, don't worry, I'm going to help you. You know, I see you're, you're holding my hand so tightly. Don't worry, I'm not going to let go. So that's like Hashem, like compared to like, a, you know, a, per, a human being is like a two-year-old kid compared to an adult, you know? <laughs> so to Hashem, we're like, we're almost like that two-year-old kid. And um, when Hashem feels that we're, we're holding Hashem's hand, like we rely on Hashem and we realize that, you know, all of our lives and all the lives of the people in Israel are in Hashem's hands. And when we're not afraid and we we're, we're able to have, go walk around with that peace of mind that Hashem is going to make everything be okay, then Hashem will actually make everything, like it'll actually impact the future. And so our thoughts down here really have an impact on the flow of the divine beneficence down here in this world. The Maharal from Prague explains this verse from Yeshaya, Hashem Adayad, trust in Hashem forever and ever. Ki Hashem because in you, Hashem, you are the our everlasting rock. And the Maharal takes this word Oilamim, which literally means worlds, which is translated here as everlasting, and explains Oilamim is even though a person might not be befitting for the good thing to happen, because of his messed up mazel down here, he's got, uh, you know, a shlamazel. He's got bad mazel. Still, this verse in Yeshaya comes and says, Nevertheless, you might be a shlamazel. You might have a bad mazel down here. Nevertheless, you should have trust in Hashem. Because with trusting in Hashem, you have the um, the rock in in uh, forever. Hashem is my rock forever. Kolaymar oilamim. Kolaymar ki oilma zev oilma ba nivra b'shem yud ke. The ki be keep a yud k with the yud and the hey hashem made the worlds this world and the spiritual worlds were created with the yud and the hey and then by putting your trust in hashem the good that's in heaven will manifest here in this world, even if there's a bad mazel down here in this world. And so a person who puts his trust in Hashem gets the world of complete goodness here in this world. And so by putting your trust in and climbing up to sort of this oilam haba, this world to come type of spirit, then Hashem um, elicits that world to come in the present reality. Because the person down here is fully trusting and putting their whole hope and trust only in Hashem. 
And then Hashem it puts his uh, full investment into uh, into this world. So the word oilamin, the two words, the two worlds is that through betachin you draw down from the world of only goodness into the into the physical world, and it's also what it means when it says in Tehillim chapter thirty-two, verse ten. That there are many sorrows for the wicked, but he who trusts in Hashem, mercy encompasses him. The Maharal of Prague again explains, Chesed this is the Chesed Elia, and this is the infinite, unconditional kindness that comes down all the way into the world, whether or not the person was, uh, was really deserving of it. And so this brings us back to our initial story with Maishir Rabbeinu. The particular order of the verses and sequence of events is very pertinent. It says, first, Maisha was afraid. And then it says, and Parai found out. What does that sound like? He didn't believe enough. But there was a lack of trust. There was first a fear that was un that was even unwarranted. Para hadn't even heard about it yet. But the fear led to Paro finding out and Moshe needing to run away. The fear alone was not that Para already knew, otherwise Moshe would have already booked it. He was afraid Para might find out. And then that's what led to the next stage that Para did find out. And it wasn't uh, a good situation. Now Hashem, even then, miraculously saved him. The Midrashim say that Para swung a sword and it hit uh, Maisha's neck and it bounced off like a rock. And in the confusion, uh, Maisha ran away. But even that circumstance of how they finding out was an extension or a um, a result of the the lack of betachin, and with a full betachin, Pare never would have needed to find out. And this is the lesson that we can learn out of this. I'll read the last two uh, paragraphs of the Rebbe Sicha. In, uh, in Hebrew and translate as I go along because the, the words are just so powerful and so sweet. When a person faces difficulties, challenges in their personal life or in our national life, whether it's material concerns or our spiritual observances, and we see roadblocks along the way, how can I serve Hashem properly? You got to realize that the elimination of these obstacles depends on us, depends on our own conduct and our own uh, method of, of thinking. If he has full trust in Hashem, that Hashem will help him and it's going to be good. To the point where he's totally tranquil, has no worries whatsoever. And at the same time, of course, he must do whatever natural steps are needed in order to remove the obstacles. As is well known, there's there's no contradiction between true betaching and looking for ways and means within the natural order to solve one's difficulties. Most that's the general way for most people. The way we're meant to operate is we're meant to get a job in order to earn our livelihood and not just sit back and 
put her arms to the heaven and say, yeah, God, feed me. Well, I mean, Hashem, like, gives you the opportunity to get the job. Not right. like, he doesn't just, like, throw money at you, <laughs> you know? But, but like, the the, all, time, all the things... All the things that are in your life that get you where you want to go were like there. Everything is put there on like by design. Very good. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's the attitude to which you engage in the material um, avenues, the natural steps that defines the betachin. That you're not doing it because you think you know. For most people. When you plant, the nature is, it grows. For a year, that works the other way around. He plants and he davens. And miraculously, it grows. Even the planting is miraculous. We're not planting because we believe in the nature of the earth. We, we, we plant because we believe in the divine salvation. And God tells us, you know, learn a little bit of science to figure out how this works. Just the bare minimum you need in order to get by. <laughs> and once you know enough, okay, so you understand, you put the seed in the ground, that's how you do it. We're not putting it in the ground because we believe in nature. We're putting it in the ground because we believe in Hashem and Hashem told us to, to use these uh, avenues. Having this, removing these obstacles is dependent on us. When we think good and we put our full hope and trust in Hashem, then the outcome will be positive. And that's how it'll actually, that's how it'll actually take place. That all of the obstacles and hindrances will be completely nullified. And it will be good for him in an actual, real way. Not just in some abstract, ultimate sense that everything is good, but in a way that your own eyes can see. Right in the here and now, in the present reality. And just like the exodus from Egypt took place, as it says, by virtue of their trust in Hashem, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. Similarly, this is how we are going to get out of this final state of exile. Like the Medrash says, that in the merit of their hope, they are worthy of being redeemed. It's our very trust in Hashem that brings about the redemption. So it shall be with us. That through, in the merit of our betochen, that the words of our prophets will be fulfilled. That say, my salvation is very near. In, in the merit of our trust, but we put in Hashem that Mashiach is coming, that the salvation is very near. Zoichim, the Jewish people will merit, that Hashem will redeem us. With the full, true, and complete redemption, a redemption that transforms the very fabric of society, revealing the divine nature where there is world peace and prosperity and uh, no more sickness and no more hunger for all of humanity, the full and complete redemption will take place speedily in our days, literally down here uh, in a way that we can physically relate to and, um, and tangibly uh, sense in the merit of our full and complete trust in Hashem. Get her bottle. <laughs> Amen to that.
Kedeva Yeshua Silavai. That's a quote from Yeshaya, Nunvav Aleph. My salvation is near. But we have to let go of any intermediary, any, any item or personality or character that we were putting our last hope in. I think all of those threads shattered, right? <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't trust our, uh, our president. We don't trust the prime minister. We don't trust uh, this guy, that guy. There's nobody, there's nobody left to trust. The only <laughs> place we can actually put our trust in is Hashem alone. And by, by casting off all of these false gods and putting our trust in the real God, we um, elicit that divine kindness and goodness to be manifest here in this world as we see signs and miracles and wonders that are taking place before our eyes that we could open our eyes to it and already start seeing it here and now and um, and keep that uh, that hope and trust alive for this promised future redemption, the era of Mashiach that's been uh, prophesized about throughout all of the prophets about what the world will be like when Mashiach comes by um, by envisioning that clearly in our mind and um, and hoping and trusting that that uh, that that is real and that it's going to uh, to take place any moment is what will uh, flip the script and bring about that redemption in a way that um, that it's apparent for all to see. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a game plan. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> You still have those books I forgot last time I was over. Yeah, if anybody wants to learn uh, Shad Habitaka, and I bought a number of copies. It's a phenomenal book written uh, around the year, uh, you know, in the in the 1000s, you know, what's it called? Uh, 1000s, 1080s, whatever. Uh, by Rebbeinu Bechayu Ibn Pekuda, talking about how to have trust in Hashem and the real nature of trust in Hashem. It's something that just learning more about it and what it entails, what it means to have true trust in Hashem, itself empowers us to actually feel that way. <laughs> because there are so many doubts that can be brought up as to why we shouldn't feel that way. We have a million and one reasons why we shouldn't feel that way. But... The um, the author Rebbeinu Bachayim Bakuda goes through and um, and analyzes each one. Today we spoke about the sort of challenge of maybe I'm not worthy. Well, that's that's been uh, clearly negated as not a reason to have a lack of trust in Hashem because Hashem will bestow goodness and kindness to those who are deserving and even to those that are not deserving. But he goes through a number of different hindrances and challenges. And um, really, that's what um, the media is trying to sell, is a lack of trust, to feel anxious, to feel worried, to not feel tranquil and okay. And it does take a certain level of work, effort. It's not just, um, you know, a um, an easy fix like a drug, but... By by reading it and learning it and um, and delving into it and and really working on yourself to um, to cast off all all foreign uh, hopes and um, and mediums of salvation. <laughs> cast your burden on Hashem alone. That uh, elicits the uh, divine providence and and blessings. Of uh, that uh, that we're hoping for, and so we're not just hoping that you know at the end of the day God knows what He's doing and everything's going to be all right. But the best good that you could possibly fathom, you put your trust in Hashem, and uh, and we'll see that manifest in our lives. And not a and not a day is wasted, even if it uh, however long it takes to get there. Not a day is wasted when we live our lives in that type of way, because that's what frees us to 
be truly active, to do our part in this world, to be active partners with God in bringing that divine goodness into this world, rather than being crippled by the anxiety and worry and, and oh, being overwhelmed by the impossibility of the circumstances, because the circumstances don't define our reality. It's the divine salvation that defines our reality, which is beyond the limitations of the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. I think this uh, Bitachon philosophy is a great um, thing against marketologists because they they always like, oh, you should buy this and then you'll be happy. Oh, you should like, oh, this is what is missing in your life. Otherwise, you would be so miserable. And you know, like <laughs> they brainwash people, like uh, like buy more, buy more, buy more, mm -hmm. right? And like uh, when you don't have Bitachon, you, you become like a like a puppet right so you like try to but like when you believe that no i don't need to f to have something to feel worthy uh like i you know like i you in control so that's a very good uh yes, i would say don't trust the salesman yes exactly. <laughs> yes yes the yes, name is neil right yes. <laughs> telling you air Better than bottled water, you can get the uh, air sold to you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, hurry up! Like, offer will not uh, last long. This is your last chance to be like happy, to be like successful. No, that is how they get to you, right? <laughs> but now. then you can. Oh, I have bit of fun, you know. Like, I am like uh, I'm protected. Yeah, consumerism <laughs> is is a form of drug abuse. Yes, it's the anxiety exactly. and whatever, but but if I buy a number of things, yeah, yeah, yeah. through those like Amazon uh, binges, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yes, and people oh, compete and they like they do this. I don't do, I don't do Amazon my... binges. <laughs> whatever, yeah. it doesn't work, right? What do you say, Susan? <laughs> I don't do Amazon binges. I've been boycotting Amazon. Good for you. Good I look you. elsewhere, <laughs> and you know what? I'll tell you all something. If you're Amazon people. I yeah. can always get a better deal somewhere else when I look elsewhere other than Amazon. Yeah. Anything Winco. I want. Winco. Oh, really? <laughs> Winco. Yeah. Oh, that's really? they, they get you in with um, you know, that quick shipping, but then you know, you you stop shopping around and you end up paying double the price and you don't realize how much you're paying for shipping. <laughs> <laughs> always something. There's nothing like going out in the redwoods and going for a walk. We live That's true. we <laughs> live in one of the most glorious places where if you really want to get connected to the beginning of everything, all we have to do is walk out our front door and just keep walking away from the stores into the ocean, the uh, woods. You know, you guys are in Arcata. I'm in Garberville. I look out my window. There are redwoods. Yep. And... Uh, we yeah, got to. <laughs> right. Yeah, we got. That's how I I have always um just had to get near the dirt. I have to smell the dirt. <laughs> and then I get close to um feeling very spiritual and you know this I'm really impressed with the way you present Rabbi Eli Ellie. You're really Thank cool. You, it's like, you know, I I don't know about any of the rest of you, but I go I belong to a 12 step program. And I'm very devoted to it. And it's the Al-Anon one, the one for the people who don't do the alcohol and drugs. But I've been doing it for years and years. And um, when I went to, I don't remember the reading. When did I go to your little Shabbat um, talk? And Rabbi was saying things and it was like, it was like stuff right out of the stuff I've been studying and it's uh -huh. really easy to connect to it. And then a friend of mine told me that what happened with the 12 step programs is they took something like 20 of the most known religions in the world and brought all the people together to come up with the most important things spiritually. And so in Judaism, what the Judaic words are kind of reflect it all. It's, it's just mind blowing. And um, I wasn't sure what this discussion was going to be about. I didn't realize, I should have realized it was going to be about a lesson. I mean, that's what it always is, right? But I don't know, I'm clueless. Half the time <laughs> I walk 
background forgetting who I am, right? <laughs> and well, so that, that's what Torah it, means. Torah is the lashon hayira. It means lesson. So we can't we can't learn Torah and not derive a lesson from it. Then then we exactly. haven't learned Torah, right? But you know, it's the same story you were saying before. Like when when the people were drowning and the floods were happening in um, New Orleans, and you know there was a joke going around about how you know this guy was hanging out on his roof waiting for God to save him, but a right. boat came along and life rafts right. came along, but he was waiting for God. And then right. so finally when he dies and he sees God, so God said, what the hell was the matter with you? I sent you a raft. I sent you a boat. You know, you're supposed to do something and help yourself. And that's just what we're all saying here. Right. And, you know, life is very disconcerting right now. It's really true. And really hard you know I, I don't know about you guys I just don't read the news and I let my grandchildren who were raised in Israel tell me their perspective and most of them are not there but the two two girls are still there and it's very scary and and the people they're not sleeping in the children's protected rooms right now but right. you know they're all ready and they had to go into a really strange I mean they were they were in alert where they grew up in Yad bin Yamin and it's very scary and it's scary both ways I mean I don't know about you guys I don't really want to see the Palestinians annihilated that's me personally and I mean uh, I don't think any the, people the Torah is what teaches the value of human life and that's our uh, culture and society is is promoting life and promoting peace and promoting um the the value of um the human being as a as a person created in the image of Hashem. I hope so. And I hope enough young people can live from the different perspectives so that they can bring together what has to be brought together. The human mind is beautiful and brilliant. And there is no reason for the human mind and brain to figure out a way that we can all flourish. But for some reason, the human humans also like blow up guns and tearing flesh apart and killing. And it's like, it's always Darth Vader and Han Solo. It doesn't stop. You know, it's ongoing forever. <laughs> David and Goliath. And yep. I mean, it's been going, how long has it been going on with the Jews and the Chinese oh. and everybody? Oi, all I can say is, oi. Hashem tells us, choose life. And um, and this is, this is our culture and this is what we've been promoting. And... Um, Unfortunately, like a lot of the uh, the movies try to portray, there is good and evil, and it is a um, it is a battle between a um, a type of culture and society that's that's promoting death and um, and using even sexual violence as a way of uh, of attack, and so the most horrific things that um, perhaps we we've ever seen in our in our entire brutal human history that um is like living right on our borders it's um well, you know a... people when they buy a house in arcade or eureka they look at you know the registry list to see you know how many people are living in what area and you know imagine living on the border where there's you know who knows how many tens of thousands of of people that were brought up from a very young age with such a evil ideology it's um it could be quite frightening and then fear inducing and that's why it's so important that we have the trust in hashem and that we even though who knows i mean there's there's great um you know security experts and politicians and and within the jewish people everybody's got an opinion as to how to best solve this conflict but even if like uh, our own little minds can't even think our way out of this one. It doesn't negate the ability to put our full trust in Hashem that Hashem can solve this problem better and quicker and with less death and suffering than than any of us can can possibly imagine. I heard it. Best case scenarios. So sorry. Hey, my I heard a really good article yeah. on this. Uh... I was in Johannesburg's in Santon in South Africa. It was yeah. on the anniversary of the 67 war and a really lovely uh, Rav, a Chabad rabbi in Santon gave over. It was a, it was a, she was doing a shell in the shul. 
and he was talking about how scared people were and you know what, what a great nace it was who won the war. And then he brought in a, a gentleman who was Israeli, who he was in full on Chabad attire, he had a big gray beard, and he had a kapata and hat. And he said, you know, I hear what the rabbi was saying about people being scared, but that wasn't me because I was a soldier and I didn't uh, I didn't think about the graves being dug, what we were facing. I just got in there and did it. And I think what, and we were in the comments section earlier, we were talking about Ish Mitzri, about the Mitz Mitzra. And I think it's yep. a Gaulist mentality and a, and, a, and a different mentality. And I think that's to both their detriment and the great respect I have for Israelis. It's like, it's just a different way of seeing things. You know, not that it's all perfect and one's scared. It's just, I think we have to develop less of a Gaulist mentality. I think that's what Moshe Rabbeinu had to go through in the Parsha, where he's mm -hmm. identified, he identifies Ish Mitzri, it triggers, like he's raised in the, in the, in the palace, he's, but he's born in Gaulist. He's not like, he's not like Yosef, the Sadiq, who, who goes to Gaulist and never denies that he's an Ivri. He's raised differently and he has to get through that. And then yeah. later in the war, he, he's identified as an Ish Ish Mitzri by the uh, by his future wife, the daughters. Yep. yep. So it's, it's, I think it's reflective of like a Gaulist mentality that we have to. It has to do with the Tachon and Imuna, but I think it has to deal with the reality of what of identifying what our Gaulus is, what our exile is. Yeah, and in a way, it was because Moshe went through that uh, that different style upbringing within the Egyptian culture. And the shub or the transformation that he went through throughout his life from being afraid to being the greatest um, prophet and, and leader of the Jewish people is, um, in a way, something that Yosef Hatzadik never had to, you know, he went down to, to, he was sold as a slave and he was thrown in prison and he had all those trials. But the first 17 years of his life, he grew up in Yaakov's household in a holy environment. And so he had, in a way, the proper chinuch, that, uh, that spiritual upbringing. But um, those of us that didn't have that type of upbringing from a young age are, in a way, equipped to do the transformation of teshuva, putting our trust in Hashem from that, uh, that space of fear and anxiety. And within each and every one of us, we... We've all sort of gone through, I don't know, the different uh, stages of uh, of mourning since October 7th, from denial to disgust to anger to, I don't know, whatever, uh, a, whole, a whole confusion of, uh, of emotions and feelings and stuff. It's time to lock into this, um, into this spiritual mentality of, of closeness to Hashem and... And 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 our full trust that the circumstance may logically and physically seem like there's no easy way out without uh, a tremendous amount of sacrifice to um, you know as careful as they are to, there's going to be here yeah, fallen soldiers and there's going to be civilian casualties and you know we can't even fathom like how how would you do it without that but. God is not locked into our comprehension of the situation or our solutions. And we also don't have the say to, uh, you know, if you came up with an ingenious plan, it's not like anybody's listening. Right? <laughs> but, you know, in the 60s, it was like, if they have a war and nobody came, nobody would get killed. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm still in that headspace. I'm old, but all of us uh, from the 60s are all in our 80s, now, 70s and 80s now. And I'm getting older and older and it's like, I'm going back to the land personally. I mean, I've started going back to my cabin. I've started a permaculture thing up there. I just can't take it. It's like, no. get me off. It could, be, it could be so overwhelming to the point where, yeah, you might need to turn off the news and, and, and binging on news is also a form of addiction because you feel like you have some sort of control just by knowing what's going on. But if you check more than once or twice a day, You've already fallen into the uh, trap of addiction to a certain degree of just like this false sense of security and control by watching all the pundits and all of the newscasts. It's like, well, if there's something important to know, you'll figure it out. You know, it's not like, you know, it's just like you just have to chop wood and carry water every day.
Just take care of take care of your basic living realities. You know, do what you do to make money, do what you do to eat, to take care of yourself, to be good, to, you know, whatever. There's nothing else to do. You have to just take care of yourself and be as good a person as you can stand being. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know? and do it with with that tranquility of full betachin, because that's what empowers us to truly be our, our greatest uh, version of ourselves, the most proactive, the most influential, the most, um, you know, productive and fulfilling our purpose and therefore finding meaning and, and joy. It could be found all through Bittachin versus the fear and anxiety that cripples you from fulfilling your purpose, that makes it hard to uh, find meaning, where you're drowning in the alcohol or drug of choice. I'm just enjoying looking at the baby. This is the new baby. I can't believe she's taking a bottle from you, Mama. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. She's a big smiler. She really interacts. You got to come over for Shabbos again, Susan. Well, I'm coming over soon because I have to do an in-service and I'm going to make time to do the thing that we talked about, Mishki, with... um. With, I have to bring. I have to open my list of the kids' names okay. to get the right name. So, 